Hello again, and welcome to War Stories, media war stories, behind the scenes tales from the front lines of the media. I am your host, Tom Curley, and uh, welcome to the show. For those of you that are tuning in for the first time, what the hell took you so long? Um, uh, basically, uh, I work for CBS uh, News for almost 40 years, and I tell stories uh, from behind the scenes, weird uh, crap that happened uh, to me and I talk with friends of mine who are also behind the scenes and in front of the scenes and of course one of the best is my old friend Joe Marcus veteran TV audio engineer hey Tommy. has the distinction hey how you doing has the distinction of being the head audio guy for the CBS morning news in all of its iterations for god knows how many years um Anyway, welcome to the show again. How you doing today? Thank you. Doing good. Doing good. Keep. I'm keeping busy. That's that's the most important thing. I know other people who are retired, they, and I hear, oh, I got nothing to do. I got lots of things to do. I have told that <laughs> to everybody, and I'm not the first one to say it, but I don't know how I got anything done before I retired. I really don't. Because right, I am right. busy all the time. And and I got to be honest with you, I, I I started, one of the reasons I started doing this show, one of the reasons that I, I, I built a, a TV studio in my basement is that after 10 years of retirement, I got bored. And then one day I said, you know, I, I actually have enough equipment to do this, so what the hell? So then I started doing, you know, th this show and get off my lawn. And now I'm doing stuff uh, for my wife's, uh, she runs the publicity department for the Westport Rotary Club. And and then, of course, I have an audio theater group that we're performing this weekend. I am too busy. I need to retire. I just really don't have any time. <laughs> so, yeah. So, so be, be beware of what you wish for. You We went out Sunday night. In the past, I could never go out Sunday night or during the week, right? I always had to get up early in the morning. I either had to take off, take, you know, take the day off or something or reschedule. Now it's like, oh, Sunday night, no problem. I don't have to get up. Yes. <laughs> that is one of the things you are. It is so true. When I retired, uh, the, the last shift that I was doing uh, was a seven at night till three in the morning shift of the Bulletin Center, um, which I'll explain in, in another episode. But when I retired, I found that my natural body rhythms um, I like staying up till three in the morning. And so basically I've kept the yeah. same, the same schedule cause it doesn't matter now. And, and people have gotten so used to it. They'll go, gee, you know, we we have something, but it's like at 11 in the morning. Uh, can, can you, is it okay? And I go, we can get up, you know, we can wake up early <laughs> yeah. and live like normal people if there's a reason to, but if there's no reason to, we don't. And, and, you know, you're right that, that the worst part of that shift, the morning news shift, which when it first started was the worst shift in the building was that, you know, it was one in the morning till nine in the morning and you always had to go to bed early. Um, and, right. and it was horrible. And, and then when I think CBS management realized that this was the worst shift they went wait hold our beer we created up to the minute which was an even worse shift <laughs> which was which was midnight which was sometimes eight at night till eight in the morning and the problem was the like, same thing with with your shift if you think about it is when you got to your weekend all right you had a long friday you got off nine o'clock on friday and you had Saturday and Sunday. They used to tell us, because we'd get off at 6 in the morning, oh, you've got like a three-day weekend. No, you don't. Because if you want to have a normal weekend, you have to completely switch your schedule to live like a normal person. Right. Otherwise, you're not going to see anybody. You know, normally you would be going to right. bed at, yeah. And then, you. so you were always right. in a state of jet lag. And I, I always hated it. Well, they every once in a while, they come out with these studies, like they paid for all these really, really scientific studies that show that you should keep your same schedule on the weekend and you'll do much better 
with keeping the same schedule over the whole weekend. It's like, yeah, I'm going to really get up at uh, three o'clock in the morning on the weekend and then just what sit around. And, and of course, yeah. there was always the state of always being tired. Always being yes. tired. Yes. I could fall always. asleep we were anywhere. In... Yes. Joey, we could fall asleep. And, and Joey, you were the best at it. He could fall asleep sitting up in a chair. I mean, with no props whatsoever, <laughs> just just sitting up. Right. I mean, we had one guy, he fell asleep. He fell asleep standing up, leaning against a door jam. And I looked and he was I sound asleep. It. Oh, yeah, we were. We uh, I remember we had a we had a bed that we made behind the audio console. There was a wide space between the floor and the audio console. And we we put down, you know, a, a mattress and pillows and we would rotate. We would take naps uh, there, but they were underneath the speakers. And the, the think about it, the speakers in, in our control room, they were huge. I mean, really big right. speakers. So we could not only go to sleep anywhere, we could go to sleep underneath two giant speakers blasting out the the morning news. And I don't know about you, but right. all I remember I've is- I've always I been had, tuned to, I could sleep anywhere with any noise going on and I'm triggered for silence. If all of a sudden yes. everything stops, yes. goes to silence, I will wake up instantly. Oh. Yes, so. and it's so true. That, now here's the problem: did you ever, did you ever fall asleep between long pieces? Like we'd be running a three-minute, oh, absolutely. we'd be running a three-minute segment. And I would fall asleep, and it was the silence. Well, sometimes when people would introduce me, they'd say. This is Joe Marcus. He's been doing this show forever. He could do it in his sleep, and he very often does. So it's like. <laughs> yes. Now, I don't know about you, but I learned this from a, another uh, engineer. I can't remember his name. He was one of the older guys, uh, Mike. I think he did uh, uh, As the World Turns. But anyway, I always used to keep my hand on whatever was the next thing was whatever was the next fader yes, that I, we were going to need to go also. to. Okay? Right. So when when you went when you were like and when you suddenly woke up, <gasps> your your reflex would be to open up that fader. <laughs> and so right. it saved my ass a million times. But this guy, he would take his hand and he would just go like that and he would open up every fader on the board. Ah yes, the <laughs> <laughs> And then and then Put stuff down, you know, that you know you t you didn't need, and hope that nothing would play that wasn't supposed to. Oh God, yes, that yes, is it's, so. It's happened. Uh, yeah, true. It, all of those things have happened. You know, or you, you just even if you're not sleeping, all of a sudden they they call for something, and you know about where it is, so you you slap open about four or five faders at the same time <laughs> and hope that you caught the right one. <laughs> And that the uh, and that there's nothing, you know. Maybe there was something on the other one. You killed it right away, and they look at you and go, "What was that?" It's like I don't know. Not, it's like, <laughs> well, I don't know. Uh, maybe it's maybe it's maybe it's something on the set. Maybe it's maybe it's a right. staple gun. I don't know. <laughs> so so um, I I saw um, I don't know why I thought about this. Um, I was reading a story. Um, about uh, Taylor Swift uh, at the uh, Music Awards. the I think it was the MTV VMAs or whatever the hell. I didn't watch it, but uh, right, yes. in sync, uh, apparently reunited. Who I I didn't even know. I knew vaguely. I I knew that they were a, a famous boy band, and and oh okay, I guess you know they all were. Um, and Taylor Swift was going crazy because she was like a kid when they came out and uh and the only reason i thought of it is i saw a facebook post you you posted where uh in sync was on the morning news and you got a picture of them with uh with your kids right they they came in my my kids were also that that same age they were you know nuts about the uh, in sync when i saw they were going to be on i said okay this is a special occasion i had to pull them out of school they came in we taped a it was I don't remember the, the the date, but it was it was a, a Christmas performance, 
So they usually would do a bunch of those and then hold them until the Christmas week or even Christmas Day. So they um, they did a performance of one of their Christmas songs. Afterwards, they came into the audio booth for um, for a listen to the playback. So it's it was all five of them, myself, um, Lee Solomon, who was um, with me as audio, and um, and their bodyguard and their audio guy. There was and this is a little a little audio booth. This was in forty four. They all came in. They listened to the playback. Everybody liked it. They were thrilled. I had a camera and I turned around and I said, can I get one quick picture with the girls? They said, sure. And I was ready to take it. And then the audio guy says, um, why don't you get in the picture also? So I threw him the camera. I basically just kind of turned around. He took one picture and that was it. And it came out great. So uh, well worth it. Fun day. Absolutely. It must you must have been absolute cool dad of the millennium on that one. Damn. Absolutely. Uh, did, and the girls was like, "Did you? Oh my God, we met in sync." <laughs> like, that's that's great. Did you have to write a, a and note? You could see how young to, they to the were teacher? too. I know. I know. No, I, I I think they just called in sick. I I don't I don't remember how you know what we did. My wife probably did. I, I would have. Uh, I don't think Did she it. said they're going oh. to see InSync so they can come to school today. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is that is awesome. So I um uh, so today we're going to talk about uh remotes. Uh we have been on a lot of remotes. Crazy remotes. Um yes. And uh, see one of the cool things that that Joe has done and I'm I've always impressed and always felt stupid that I didn't is you took pictures of everything. You took pictures of every person, when I could. you know, every time you could, when you could. And, and that was great. I, I also I handed did. the camera off because a lot of the times I was in the control room and I couldn't be taking pictures. So, you know, I would have these smaller autofocus cameras just said, here's the button, just press it. And, you know, that's the shutter release and that's it. And I would just give it to people and hope that the camera didn't get lost somewhere, and 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 we got some pictures on the way back. So, uh, yeah, I tried. Yeah. We got and, we got a so, decent amount. There's some good pictures in there. Oh, absolutely! You have some great great pictures, and and I love doing this these broadcasts because I don't have to go through Google and try to find stuff. So so speaking <laughs> of pictures, um, we we have talked in the past. I don't know if I talked with you about it or I might have done it with Gary. Um, one memorable memorable remote was uh, the 1984 Democratic Convention in Los uh, San Francisco, which we did at the Fairmont right. Hotel. Yes, we did. We did talk right. about it. We talked about how we had to uh, jack the truck up because the hill was so steep. Right. And um, but one of the cool things about that uh, was we did a lot of sightseeing. And how, I don't know, we weren't there that long, but we went to a lot of places. Well, the convention and, is and, usually like at least four days, and we have to have a few days of setup. So it's probably, you're talking a good two weeks that we were there. Really? Oh. Yeah, huh. well, because Maybe we had right. to, um, yeah, because you have to wire, we had to wire the truck. We had a few different locations. Um, you know, that we were inside the, at the Fairmont and, um, you know, it's, it's, we have to set up and patch the truck and then the convention itself, we have to be there, even though we weren't at the convention, we were there for at least most of the days that it was, you know, going on. Um, and, and so we always, and especially with the time difference, even when we were doing it, doing the live show. With the, the three hour time difference, we were off the air uh, at 6 a.m. local time. 6 a.m., yeah. So you're right. What, and wide awake. What are you going to do for the rest of the day? Even if we have a, a taping here or there, most of the times we had our days free to do whatever we wanted. You know, that's and a very good point. We made use point. of that. <laughs> my, we did. I, I would See, always say, but, I would call my wife and say, We did this and we did that. And she says, Don't you guys ever work? And it's like, yeah, once in a while. So <laughs> once in a while, we 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 
we do. So anyway, the point is, we did some really cool things. Um, I remember, and here's the weird thing. Uh, I think I got there later. I I couldn't have been there because somebody had to stay back in New York and actually mix the show. So you you and right. Billy and everybody would go, and then I would be stuck. And then I would usually come like the day before or maybe two days before. But in my memory, we did all these things in one day. And now that I'm thinking about it, and as you bring it up, it was impossible because we did so many things. Yeah. <laughs> but I do remember that at the end of the last day, um, the last day, we did – try to cram in as much as possible and all i remember is is in the evening we were suddenly to my mind we were in a a a, a baseball game we were at a major league baseball game sitting in the stands with a six pack of <laughs> anchor steam beer and i just remember looking like how the hell did i get here what have we been doing so let's see what what did we do we went to alcatraz that was really cool. We went to Alcatraz. Um, we went on the, uh, as far as I know, on the the regular full tour uh, of yes. Alcatraz. Yes. And um, here's a couple of pictures of that. And uh, okay. I think it was it was Billy and uh, and Frank Billy Nader and Frank Governale were we all right. We went right. together. Frank was the the TD, um, and right. uh, we shared a car. They wanted to save money on cars, yes. so they gave us large cars. I think we had a Lincoln Town car, so you could fit yeah, four people in car. with their luggage also. So uh, yes, yes, they, they did um, that. And so we went to Alcatraz, and why, right? And then the the submarine that's right, uh, that's also right over there. The U.S. The USS. It's either the remember. USS Pompano. It's the USS Pompano, or Papeo. I'll look it up. Uh, right. It was a World War II class submarine, uh, tiny, right. tiny, tiny. I can see why, uh, you know, in the Navy, sub submariners, uh, they had a, a height, they had a height limit. You couldn't, if you were above a certain height, you couldn't serve on a submarine because they were just too short. Smack your head. And uh, <laughs> oh, smack your head. And um, the the uh, uh, the captain's quarters was literally the size of a toilet closet. It was just, and that was the spacious quarters. Uh, no, that was fascinating. The thing about Alcatraz that I remember that was so cool, uh, the, uh, part of the tour is that they, you know, uh, Alcatraz was a maximum security prison. Uh, only You had to be committed uh, committed murder or broken, or committed murder while in another prison, and then you got sent to Alcatraz. <laughs> so it was only like 300 prisoners, but they were the worst of the worst. And so everything was designed to psychologically make you know that you were in prison. And all I remember is they showed us at night when they closed the prison, the, the cell doors, they all closed at the same time. And they made the yes. most unbelievable noise. It was just, imagine yeah. 300 jail cells. You go, Chuck, it, it echoes. <laughs> Yeah. Echoes. And it's they also like, turn off the shit. light to show you what it's like at night there. And you're in like yeah. this pitch black cell. Pitch black cell. <laughs> and then they they threw us in there was a thing called D block, which is their solitary confinement, which was just a a bare room. There was no furniture. It was a steel floor and steel walls and a hole in the corner as a toilet <laughs> and they would throw you in there and it was incomplete. I mean, I can see now to be honest, what, well, you know, solitary confinement is torture. I mean, uh, you know, if there's ever been a definition of cruel and unusual punishment, you know, that's it. Uh, the only other thing I remember about there is um, uh, they said they had some of the best food of any prison system. It was like three star Michelin <laughs> gourmet food. And, and the reason was because that was the only time when all the prisoners were together, uh, you know, loose in the in the dining room. And right. that would be the time when there would be a riot. So as long as they had like really, really good food, they were motivated, 
you know, not to not to put up with any with any shit. And of course, the guards up on the turrets pointing guns at them might have had something to do with that too. I don't know. Yeah. But uh, so yeah, we did that. We did the submarine. I re- we went out <laughs> oh, to uh, Muir Woods. Muir Woods, which was really fascinating. Uh, got to see the, you know right, all the yeah. redwoods. That we went was on just... war- we went on a walk and saw saw all the trees. You know they they show you a, a cut tree and it says you know this here it was it was this... it was still growing at the time of the Magna Carta and and stuff like that. Right, <laughs> and and here's how big it was when Jesus Christ was born. Uh, yeah, some of these trees are thousands of years old, which is which is crazy. But I do remember, um, when we when we were going to Alcatraz because it, it's an island, you got to get on a boat. So we were going to whatever the boat was, and we were in the, right. the Fisherman's Wharf district, right? And there was two homeless guys, right? And one guy was one was in a dumpster, and he was looking for food, and the other guy was just talking to nobody and what he was talking about was all of the food that he's found and and we walked by and you heard this guy go (laughs) oh and then one time i found some clams and some corn and some bacon and we got on the boat and i thought nothing of it well when we finished the tour we got back the same two guys were there and the guys go and then there was this other time where i found some beef jerky and (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> he's still he's still describing food that he's found. So I don't know why that why that stuck in my head. Um, let's see. We drove down Lombardi Street, which is a famous thing L- in San Lombard Francisco. Street. Well, Lombard I think we street. wanted to see it. It's the it's the curvy street, and it was you know especially in this Lincoln Town Car that you know was a half a block long by itself. Um, going you know. They, they show some of the things like you, on any of the San Francisco streets, if you have a long hood on the car like those were at the time, uh, you can't see over the hills as, as you're getting to the crest of a hill. But um, on Lombard Street, it was just like you're, you're going so slow because the damn car is so big. But after we did it, it was like, wow. Uh, and I don't remember who went first, but then it was like, now I could say I drove down Lombard Street, and it's like I think I said, "Well, I'd like to do it also." So we drove all around and switched drivers, and then I drove down Lombard Street, and then we did it again. And I think we all took turns, so we could all say we drove down Lombard Street. <laughs> yeah, I remember. I remember that was that was terrifying because you're right; you couldn't yeah, see. Yeah, you have to go very, very right, slow. Very slow because I mean, it's literally you're having to make a hundred and eighty degree turn. Uh, like you know, and it was, it wasn't that wide, like the width of a street. Yeah, it was a crazy street. Yeah, that was that was yeah. that was absolutely wild. Um, yeah, well, that and was, we also that did was stuff, crazy. just fun stuff. We we went on the cable cars. I remember we saw the cable car. Um, uh, the 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 big area that oh, has all the right. uh, cabling for the cable cars. Yeah. And then we went down to the bottom. Apparently, there's a big thing you're supposed to do. Um, when the cable car gets to the end of its line, it, it's on a big, lazy Susan. And Yes, and the driver the gets, gets, gets out, out and turns yeah, it by hand. Gets out and turns it by hand. I'm not sure how the hell that works, yeah. but he could literally rotate the cable car 180 degrees, and then it would go you know, back in the back. other direction. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I think the only thing, let's see, yeah, we learned to drink Anchor Steam beer. And uh, I don't think we had rice aroni, the San Francisco treat. But, uh, you know. No, uh, I don't think so. <laughs> forget. Um, two things. Uh, why did we have such a large car? Why did we have a car to begin with? Well, the the show was being done oh, at the Fairmont yeah. Hotel. And you would think that, well, why would we need a car? You know, we're staying at the Fairmont Hotel. No, no. We were not staying at the Fairmont Hotel. The anchors and the executives were staying at the Fairmont Hotel. They put us up in some hotel in friggin' Oakland, <laughs> across in Oakland, the by Oakland the airport. Bay Bridge. Right. We right. had. How long was our our commute was our commute was almost as bad as it was at home. It was close to an hour commute. <laughs> yes. R- right. Remember? Yeah. It yes. Was, uh, it was. You know. It was right. It was, and and that's why they had to get get us the cars, and that's why that's the whole thing. 
and it was just a lot cheaper. Yeah. But uh, now, right after that, the second convention, the the Republican convention, which took place in uh, in Dallas, and we were at the um, the Hyatt Regency, which is the the hotel with um, it's got multiple buildings, and each one is, uh, you know, it looks like steps because each one is is a little higher than the next. And then there's a separate building with the big dome on the top of it. it looks like a, a large ball. They always showed it uh, on the uh, on the credits of the of the show Dallas, a uh, very famous hotel there. And um, we we did that in a also a very little truck. And we were on the the rooftop of you know it wasn't the highest roof, but we we had to run cabling all all the way up the stairway to this rooftop long way up and uh it was again one of those things where they said uh, i asked them you know because you usually try and find out how many inputs you need and they you know i asked specifically any bands or music or anything like that no absolutely not nothing nothing like that so of course the next to last day or something like that they come in and they say oh by the way we have the fabulous Thunderbirds. They're going to be on the roof. And it's like, you've got to be kidding. We don't have, there's no way we have enough lines that, that go up there. Well, we have to do it. So at that point already, all we could do was I put up a couple of shore mixers on the roof to submix the drums. And I remember, um, I think uh, it was Jack Katz was the, uh, was the audio assist on the roof. And there was no way even to monitor it. And he says, I can't do it. I can't even hear what I'm doing. And I said, I'm going to talk it through you. We're going to plug everything in. And then I'm going to tell you to bring things up and down. And then just leave it there. And we did that. And I took the rest of the band and the vocal mics. We had a Radio Shack reverb unit that sounded awful that I barely used. And... uh, and we went with it and and it it worked it was it was a you know the worst way to do it but uh but we got through it and it was live so uh i've i've heard it, it doesn't it doesn't sound bad for what it was and and we also <laughs> had what at that time i don't know if it was a first or not but while we were on this one rooftop um the rooftop lower down from us which was a a few stories i don't know maybe uh, you know, four or five stories lower than us. Good Morning America was there. And um, we were always kidding about that. Well, also, they decide that they want to do a simulcast where... I remember that. Bill Curtis is going to talk to um, David Hartman on on the two rooftops. So we got together with uh, with... The ABC people who I did know because I I did work there for for a number of years and I knew them all. So we sent them a feed of uh, of one of our cameras and one of uh, and and Bill Curtis's mic. And they did the reverse for us. And this way, when they had to coordinate the timing coming out of a commercial, but then all of a sudden, uh, David Hartman goes, I think I hear some noise or something like that. And he looks up and of course, and then Bill Curtis at the same time is saying, wait, I hear something. And he looks down and then the two of them start talking to each other. And David Hartman was saying, yeah, I heard some music the other day, which was the fabulous Thunderbirds. And, um, and they did that, which was kind of a, a very weird thing because people who are watching it at home, it's like, wow, I have CBS on ABC and, uh, and ABC is on CBS at the very same time. It was a, a cool thing. Wasn't that difficult, but I remember it, it worked that. out really well. I remember that. Yes, I remember that. Um, I wasn't on the remote. I was in New York. I was mixing the show. And I remember all of the coordination that was going on, not just right. with us um, d- doing it, um, but also with all the producers in the back row talking with the producers uh, at ABC and everybody, we were having a really good exactly, time. We were right. all very proud of ourselves, and it, it was very <laughs> strange because we had both we had both monitors up, so you could you know see it happening, and, and it was it, actually right. pretty flawless 
it was a lot of fun. Yeah, it, it was. A lot it, of fun. It, it, it um, was. I, think, I don't think there was a problem with it. I said the toughest part after we just, you know, worked out the, the cabling back and forth, because, again, we had to run more cables up the stairway and everything back and forth. But the, the toughest thing was the producers coordinating exactly when this was going to happen on two networks. So, uh, yes, they and, did it. And producers, producers coordinating. It's you know, bad yes. enough with, <laughs> within ourselves. So now we had to do it with another network. Yes, it was fun. Uh, and, and this has been fun. Uh, we had other remotes that we're going to have to get to in another show because we've done it. We've, we've wasted a half hour. Um, great show. Great. That I, I, you've, brought back memories I've completely forgotten. So uh, we will continue the remotes um, in other shows. Uh, but now uh, let's see how quickly we can get through the plugs. Um, uh, uh, Serendipity Seeking Intelligent Life on Earth, my friend Marilyn's blog that we all I contribute to. Uh, Voicecapes Audio Theater for the best in audio music and uh, audio radio and drama. Blah, blah, blah. Uh, half hour radio show called it from the 80s this back. And of course, uh, Get Off My Lawn, where we talk about life, the universe, and everything. So, Joey, this has been absolutely phenomenal. And uh, we'll do this again. See you next time. Until then, toodles. See you, Doc.